ranking every Overwatch hero easiest to hardest. To give you some perspective, I've peaked 4108 on tank, 4262 on DPS, and 4203 on support, all of which on PC. All of that to say that I'm definitely not good at the game, but I'm also not like platinum or something. I also have like way more time on DPS than the other roles, so I may or may not be biased in one direction or the other. The easiest character in the game has absolutely gotta be Moira. To play Moira, there's literally only one thing that you need to think about. Do I need to heal or do I need to do damage? There's pretty much no cooldown management. Basically, once your orb is off cooldown, you just throw one. And if you're ever horribly out of position while playing Moira, you always have a get out of jail free with your fade. On top of that, Moira requires little to no mechanical skill. Her biotic grasp will still suck onto you even if the Moira is missing by like a solid margin. And even if you choose to use Moira like a heal bot, you could still get some decent value. Next up on the list is Torbjorn. Torbjorn outputs a ridiculous amount of damage for little to no skill whatsoever. Basically you just throw a turret in the back to watch out for flankers and you just spam left clicks into the other team's tanks. Torbjorn like Moira also has an ability that pretty much makes him invincible, of course in the overload, and this type of ability, the kind that kind of makes you pretty much invincible, is going to be a common theme amongst the easier heroes to play in Overwatch. Next up comes the easiest tank in the game in my opinion is is Orisa. To be good at Orisa, pretty much all you need to do is to hold the corners with your shield, fortify before your armor goes away so you can multiply the effects of the two, and halt the enemies that are out of position. One of the biggest things that a lot of low rank Orisas do is they'll literally just throw their bongo behind their shield, and the bongo will just get instantly destroyed. So literally just hide your bongo around a corner, and I promise you Orisa is like literally one of the easiest characters to play in all of Overwatch. Next up is Brigitte. To be able to play modern Brigitte, all you gotta do is stay alive. Brig gets a ton of value just for a living. As long as you're packing your DPS to enable them to win 1v1s, as well as bailing out your other supports with health packs and inspire, you're gonna win a lot of games on Brigitte without actually needing a lot of skill. Brig, along with Moira, has one of the easier to use alts in the game. Pretty much you just want to use Rally as the fight is about to happen, rather than waiting to use it until it's too late. This type of alt, in my opinion, is a lot easier to use than something like Beat Drop or Transcendence. For those alts, you tend to have to actually have an understanding of what's happening in the team fight, of whether or not you need to use it or not. Whereas Rally and Coalescence, you kind of just use it as the fight's about to break out. This one might be controversial, but the fifth easiest hero to play is Cassidy. I feel like a lot of Cass Cass players make things more difficult for them than they actually need to. to. Like to play Cassidy, you can get a ton of value from just sitting with your tanks, not taking too many off angles, and just kind of put in a bunch of damage to the other team's tanks. As long as you're not going off by yourself too much, I promise you you'll get a lot of value from Cassidy literally for free, just because your flashbang is such a big threat. It also does obviously help to have good aim on Cassidy, uh, but a lot of times you'll get so much value from right click fan the hammers alone that as long as your aim isn't off you'll get a ton of value for free. Next up on the list is Roadhog. To play Roadhog optimally, you don't really have to think about too much. You can just go off on random missions by yourself and punish the other team for being out of position. As long as you're not playing Roadhog into like an Ana or a Zen or something like that where you're just gonna get absolutely farmed, you can get a ton of free picks even in like the highest ranks in Overwatch. And then we have Junkrat, which is a lot of people's like first thought when you talk about easy heroes. The problem is is to actually get a lot of value on Junkrat at high ranks, you almost have to be creative. It becomes near impossible to get value out of Junkrat unless you play him in a creative way against tanks like Sigma or D.Va. Although at the end of the day, you're always going to get some sort of value just by spamming into a choke on Junkrat. So it's not like I have him towards the top half of this list. I just think he's a little bit harder to play at like peak level than a lot of low rank players would give him credit for. Next up is Symmetra. To play a decent Symmetra on like a map like Hanamura first, all you gotta do is TP your team to the high ground. I feel like a lot of Symmetras are still in the mindset of, oh, we gotta TP to point, and then they'll throw their TP into the middle of the point and just instantly get blown to shreds by the other team. So as long as you have like half a brain cell, I promise you you'll be okay on Symmetra, at least for the teleporters go. As far as your gun goes, all you gotta 
do is think about is do I need to be spamming or do I need to be charging up my beam? It's also really important for Symmetra players to stay alive because if you could stay alive till the end of a team fight, you're probably up to like full charge on your beam. And at that point, it's always possible to turn like a 2v5 into a fight with. All of that to say that Symmetra definitely doesn't require the most mechanical skill in the game. So she is towards the easier side of this list. 24th is Bastion. I've heard people say that Bastion is like legitimately the easiest hero to play. And I don't necessarily see that as the case because if you actually want to use Bastion in like GM or something, you already know that the entire other team is going to be focusing you the first chance they get. So you have to play Bastion in a creative way. You have to be taking weird off angles that like nobody would ever expect you to be in, but you gotta always be moving. And I would say that the majority of your thinking while playing Bastion needs to be about positioning. Also the skill ceiling of Bastion's ult is something that doesn't get talked about enough. Like to be able to use tank form at its optimal level is something that like very little people have actually managed to master over the years. Next up on the list is Mercy. I have Mercy this high and maybe I should have put her even higher is that you can get a ton of value on Mercy that a lot of people don't even realize. Like if you're constantly damage boosting the right cooldowns from your team, like Mercy's can single handedly carry the game as long as they're damage boosting the right people at the right time. I think the single biggest thing that Mercy players do wrong is they make things too hard on themselves. I feel like a lot of supports in Overwatch have this mindset that I gotta keep everyone alive and if anyone dies it's my fault. I'll promise you you'll win more games on Mercy as long as you're always thinking about pocketing the off angle DPS. Like the second you see your soldier go high ground when the rest of your team is low ground, pocket him. Even if that means that you know your Reinhardt might die while you're pocketing the soldier. It's okay at the end of the day because that Mercy pocketed soldier is probably going to pop off. Next up is Reaper and maybe I should have put him a little bit towards the easier side. The problem is at high ranks it's almost impossible to get consistent value on Reaper unless you're getting like pocketed by a Lucio who's just like speeding you around. Reaper is another one of those DPS that are just kind of so bad in the current meta that you have to be creative to actually get value on him and it's pretty much impossible to play him well unless you have a good grasp on what's happening in the team fight. Number 21 is Widowmaker. I think this is when I need to talk about how I'm actually making this list. Like if I was making this list for somebody who's just brand new to Overwatch, I would have Widowmaker at the top or very close to the top of this list. But that's not what this is. This is how easy they are to play in like GM. And to play Widowmaker in GM, all you gotta do is really think about one thing and that's your aim. And I'm assuming that if you're at this high rank, you probably already know how to do that. There's pretty much a handful of spots on every map that Widowmakers usually go. And sure, you can do some super creative things with Widowmaker as far as like taking ridiculous off angles and getting in like weird glitch spots. But I think at the end of the day, the way to get the most value on Widowmaker is to just play the angles that everyone else plays and just aim forehead. Like there's not really a ton that you actually need to think about while you're playing Widowmaker. And so for that, she ends up on the easier side of this list. Next up is May. To play May at a higher rank, you have to be more team focused. You have to have an idea of when your team's going to engage, when the other team is going to engage, and you need to always be looking at, you know, using your wall as an isolation ability. Granted, she doesn't require nearly as much mechanical aim as a character like Widowmaker, but you actually need to have a better understanding of Overwatch to actually get value on May at a higher rank, whereas Widow can just click heads. Next up is Soldier. A lot of people make the mistake on Soldier of kind of sitting with their team or refusing to take off angles, but you're pretty much always going to get more value on Soldier by just, you know, kind of flanking a little bit. Like you almost want to play Soldier like you're being a little goofy. I, like I feel like you want the other team to like type at you for like wondering what you're doing in their back line. And you just kind of want to do crazy things. Obviously at the end of the day, if you have good aim on Soldier, you're going to play him pretty decently. But I do think he requires a little bit more thinking than some of the characters lower on the list. And then is Sigma. Sigma has a lot of things to think about. You have to manage your shield health. You have to manage your positioning, obviously. You have to aim those two little balls that aren't necessarily that easy to aim. You have accretion, you have your shift. Sigma is a weird one because how difficult Sigma is to play, I feel like depends on like what comp you're playing Sigma with. Like if you're playing him in like double shield, you can get away with doing some creative things, but it becomes a lot more difficult to not just get like completely ran over if you're playing him in like a Sig hog comp or something like that. So I don't know. I mean, yes, Sigma does require more mechanical skill than a lot of the other tanks, but at the end of the day, he just has so many tools that it almost feels like you can bail yourself out if you get yourself into like poor situations. Right above Sigma is Wrecking Ball. This might be 
might be controversial because I feel like some people think Wrecking Ball is like brain dead easy. And I feel like there's another group of people that think Wrecking Ball is probably like the hardest tank to play. I have them somewhere in the middle of my list because yes, you do have to constantly be thinking about like what cooldowns the other team has and how can I avoid getting slept here or how can I avoid getting brig bashed when to PD and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, Wrecking Ball's insane HP as well as, you know, his adaptive shield makes it harder for Wrecking Ball to get punished in comparison to some of the harder to play dive tanks in the game. You can get away with a lot more on Wrecking Ball than a character like Winston because you could always just press E and like automatically have like a thousand health. Next up is Hanzo. Hanzo has a pretty high skill floor, meaning just using your sonic arrows and spamming at the tanks is going to get you a lot of value in team fights. But he also has a pretty high skill ceiling in my opinion. Like somebody who's good at Hanzo can single-handedly carry the game, you know, through mechanical skill of hitting a tough to hit projectile across the map. Hanzo also has like insane 1v1 potential, meaning he can pretty much win a 1v1 versus like any other squishy in the game. But you could also say that about someone like Cass, but the thing is it's a lot harder for a character like Hanzo. Cass can just flash you and fan and he just wins the 1v1. But Hanzo has to do that, you know, actually hitting difficult to hit shots, you know what I mean? So it might be controversial that I have Hanzo right in the middle of my list, but I think that is where Hanzo belongs at the end of the day. Next up is Ash. I think to play Ash and to play Hanzo, you have to have a similar playstyle. Constantly be off angling, characters that like to get pocketed, you know, an insane amount of tank busting for, you know, a ranged DPS, but also on top of the tank busting, you know, this ability to win a 1v1 versus like any other character, just because of how strong your abilities are. Ash and Hanzo both also have, you know, relatively easy to use alts. Just throw Bob on point and he's for sure going to get some value. Dragon, you just shoot it in the middle of a team. But yeah, I think this makes sense to put Hanzo and Ash right in the middle of the list. Next up is Zenyatta. He's a lot more squishy though, in the sense that he doesn't have like a, an ability like wall climb or coach gun or anything like that. So positioning is going to be a lot more important on a character like Zen. But Zen has just insane tank busting capabilities. Throw a discord on a Reinhardt and you can pretty much shut him down for the rest of the game. As long as you're constantly thinking about where to put your discords to best enable your team to win the fight, as well as constantly putting pressure on the other team's tanks with, you know, your left clicks and right clicks, you'll get a ton of value on Zenyatta. I would say you do have to have, you know, a really good feeling for what's happening in a team fight to correctly use Transcendence. And all the way up until like GM, you'll see Zen's use Transcendence when it's too late and the fight's already over. Or they'll use it in situations where the fight's already won. Like it goes both ways. So yeah, I think it makes sense putting Zenyatta here. Next up is Lucio. To play Lucio at a high rank, you have to have a really good feel of when to engage and when to disengage. Assuming you're playing Lucio with like a Ryan comp or something, your speed boost, whenever you amp that speed, is going to be when your team is going to engage the fight. So with that, you have a lot of influence on how a team fight goes. On top of that, Lucio's primary fire isn't exactly easy. And to actually maximize how much value you're getting, you know, jumping around walls, going into the enemy's backline, like you gotta have like hundreds of hours on Lucio to actually get a feel of how exactly his movement works. And so for that, I think Lucio Lucio ends up being one of the harder supports to play in Overwatch. The 12th hardest character to play is the newest Overwatch character. Even though she came out like two years ago at this point, it's Echo. To play Echo from a mechanical standpoint alone, you have to be able to aim a projectile, you have to be able to track a beam, and obviously to get the most value of Echo, you pretty much have to have mastered all of the other heroes in the game, or at least all of the other heroes that are decent dupe targets. For example, if you're playing Echo and the other team has a Winston, you're going to get the most amount of value if you have really good primal rage skills or if they have like a doom fist you're gonna get a lot more value duping a doom fist if you actually know how to play doom fist and so for that alone i think you could actually make an argument that echo should be even higher on this list but i think i'm comfortable with putting her here at number 12. next up is sombra sombra is difficult not from a mechanical standpoint necessarily but more from like a team standpoint to play sombra at a high rank i feel like you have to have such good communication with your team about who you 
you're going to hack and then who you actually do manage to hack because a hack is almost useless if you don't have a team to focus that hack target right away on top of communication being an absolute necessity to play sombra well to play sombra well you kind of have to have a good flow of the character herself you have to know exactly when you should be in the enemy's backline or when you should be farming tanks for emp and it's pretty much impossible for somebody to just pick up sombra and automatically be good at her and now we're in the top 10 and at number 10 is pharah i don't know how the best pharahs in the game do what they do like to play pharah well you have to have just insane movement it takes like thousands of hours to actually manage to get aiming a relatively slow moving projectile is also something that is not easy to do whatsoever you also have to have a really good understanding of what's happening in a team fight itself to know when to use barrage and when not to i think pharah is actually probably the single most unique dps to whereas it's not like you can be good at like hanzo or good at like torbjorn or good at like i don't know any other character in the game and then suddenly switch to pharah and be good at her you absolutely need to grind pharah to actually be good at her and actually get a lot of value at higher ranks same goes for number nine which is doomfist and remember this list is more talking about like skill ceilings than skill floors like i feel like just about anyone can play doomfist and like platinum and just like punch tanks and get a lot of value just because nobody has their headset turned up so they can't hear doomfist like charging up a punch around the corner but to actually play doomfist in like gm or something like that you're going to absolutely struggle unless you know like just stupid stupid like rollouts and just crazy things you can do on doom e like every doomfist one trick and like gm plus i'll just like load up a map and like just try for like ledge jumps and different like mechanical things that you can do on doomfist just searching for some way to actually make their character viable the other way to play doomfist is a very like team coordinated doomfist which also isn't easy for like what i was saying about sombra earlier if you're super coordinated with your team and you're constantly asking for like nano boosts or like zarya bubbles or defense matrix or whatever it is that type of play just requires so much coordination that it's impossible for me to not put doomfist in the top 10 and what i was saying with doomfist right there with that it requires a lot of team coordination you could say for reinhardt as well you're not going to get value on reinhardt unless you're getting sped around you know like bubbled or defense matrix or something like that and you're not getting like immortality fielded or like nanoed or something like that to actually enable your team to win the fight what i'm saying is you're never going to be able to play reinhardt well in like gm unless you are someone who is very very coordinated and has very good understanding of when to engage and when not to engage number seven is baptiste and this might be controversial but i think i have baptiste here is because he has a really high skill ceiling meaning that there's always kind of something you can be doing on baptiste to get more value whether that's if you're like shooting a pharah down from the sky you could like turn down real click and right click your soldier or some, something along those lines where you're kind of constantly thinking about how can i get more value in a fight it also works the other way like let's say your reinhardt is very low and you're like right clicking him if you sneak in a left click between each right click you can be doing damage to the other team's tanks i will admit that immortality field and bapalt are relatively easy abilities to use just sneak the immortality field around the corner and you'll be good to go pretty much use bapalt at the start of a fight and you'll be good to go but i just feel like his gun alone as well as you know the different things you can do with his movement is what at the end of the day makes baptiste one of the harder characters to actually master in overwatch number six is zarya zarya is the character you play if you're a dps and you want to learn tank unfortunately though there's so much to learn about zarya before you could actually jump into a game with her and get maximum value the common theme with pretty much all of these top 10 is that there's always something you can be doing to get more value on these heroes for zarya that looks like you know not just using your bubbles to get charged but what if i use my bubble to actually enable my dps to make a play or what if i saved my bubble for whenever there's a tracer on my ana in the back line the challenge of playing zarya is kind of micromanaging when should i be be using my bubbles just to get charge or when should i be using my bubbles to actually help my team win the game graviton surge is one of the most interesting ultimates in the game sure it's this big powerful thing that can suck six people in but the actual skill of zarya is realizing that sometimes it's better if you don't grab six sometimes it's better to just use grab as like a tempo wall to stagger the other team and if you're somebody who's keeping full charge you can keep grabs coming like once every like 90 seconds so yeah at the end of the day zarya is very 
very difficult to learn and play at higher ranks. Number five is Winston. If you ask me what hero I'm worst at in Overwatch, I would probably tell you Winston. Remember when I was saying like Wrecking Ball has to think about all of those cooldowns on the other team and he has to kind of wait to full engage until all of those cooldowns are out? Well, Winston is just like that, except he only has 500 HP. Something that the majority of the community doesn't realize is that Primal Rage is probably the hardest ultimate to perfect in the game. The mechanics of when to swing and when not to swing and juggle people across the map is something that like legitimately like only Overwatch League players have actually managed to master. Fourth on the list comes D.Va, which is the hardest tank in my opinion to play in the game. D.Va is really cool because you can think about pretty much every single cooldown on the other team that is a projectile and you can completely negate that. If you have an insanely large brain on D.Va, you can get a ridiculous amount of value. Whether that's, you know, kind of keeping the Ana from healing her team or whether that's keeping the Genji from farming your backline. There's pretty much always something that you can be doing more on D.Va that makes her one of the hardest heroes to actually master in the game. Number three is Ana. Ana has so much capability to carry games within her kit. Playing and mastering Ana is all about finding the time to actually use those abilities in the most optimal way. Sure, you could just sit in the back and heal your team and, you know, throw a nade on your tanks off cooldown, but that's not going to win you many games at high ranks in Overwatch. To actually get value out of something like anti-nade, you need to be thinking about about how can I like off angle just slightly enough to where I can sneak in a nade. And rather than using nano boost as just, you know, just giving it to the Genji to win the fight with nano blade, you could also be thinking about how can I use this to bail out a tank or nano the DPS that's on an insane off angle that's about to like pop off and kill two. And maybe we don't even need that blade. Like Ana's just such a crazy character because you can pretty much carry each individual fight for the entirety of the game. Number two on the list is what I think a lot of people consider it to be the hardest character to play but number two is Genji. Playing Genji at high ranks is a complete nightmare whether it's dealing with you know Brig or Cass or all of these characters that just have a huge advantage over you just because Genji's kit is very underpowered in comparison to theirs. Genji is almost impossible to master. His primary fire is probably the hardest to actually get a hold of when you first pick up Overwatch. Dragon Blade is one of the harder alts to actually get value on. Just the entirety of Genji's kit is difficult and and it's no secret that he's one of the hardest characters to play in the entire game. But number one is Tracer. Tracer is number one because I think she is the one character in the game that has a true infinite skill ceiling. Meaning that even if you're the best Tracer in the world, you could still be even better. Like on Tracer, there's so much to think about. Should I be in their backline farming their supports? Or should I be on their tanks to farm pulse bombs so then I can pulse bomb their supports? Or is the other team's Tracer farming our backline so now I need to go contest the Tracer? There's no one correct way to play Tracer and there's a million different play styles. On top of that, her movement is probably the hardest movement in the game to actually master. Pulse Bomb is such a simple ability, but so hard to consistently land. Like you probably could have played Tracer for like 5,000 hours at this point and you still probably have a lot to learn. That's my list. What do you think the hardest and easiest characters are to play in Overwatch?